want you to imagine. You can close your eyes if necessary. I'm going to paint for you a beautiful word picture. Um, imagine that you're starting a new job, and you're super excited about the team and the product, the work you're doing. You get to write Elixir, so that's cool. Um, and you're excited to find out what some of your first uh, assignments are going to be. So one of the things you're told is that your team is going to be standing up a brand new web API. So you, know, you, you worked with GraphQL in the past, and that was, that was pretty good. So you venture, will we, will we be using GraphQL? But no, the answer is no. So naturally, your mind sort of drifts to rest, because that's nice and cozy. It's like an old sweater. Um, so it's probably rest. Um, but no, no. Then you, you, you start thinking some more. You kind of start thinking about implementing SOAP, and you're like a chill runs down your spine. Um, <laughs> you start thinking about that cozy sweater some more. Um, but the answer finally comes, um, and it's that you're going to be using Phoenix channels. Um, so that's what this is about. Uh, my name's Nick. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a software engineer at GridPoint. You can find me on the internet. Uh, I have a website that doesn't have much stuff on it. Um, you can find me on Mastodon or on the Bird site as ng Sherrick. Um, I'm pretty much ng Sherrick on any website you can type your username into. So if you need to get in touch with me, that's how. Um, so the, the goal really today is to talk about uh, why our team chose to use Phoenix channels to stand up a web API, uh, how we implemented it, and some lessons we learned along the way, and then uh, whether channels could be right for your team. Um, before we dive any further, I want to just like touch on the fact that I've said channels a lot already, and I'm going to say it a bunch more, and there's nothing really we can do about it. Um, let's see if this will work. Yeah, so I don't know. I've said it like probably six times. Does that seem fair? Um, <laughs> if y'all want to play along with this uh, little game I've devised for you, you can uh, let me let me put this in the let me put this away, put it in the corner here. Does that work? Hello. I just want y'all to know I'm breaking all the rules. I'm doing all kind of weird live stuff, um, and if it doesn't work, I don't care. So that's how I kind of deal with that aspect of it. Um, let me just try to mouse it down over here. There we go. Oh no, it's snapping back into place. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Hold on. Is my display manager on? That would be embarrassing. No. Um, hello. There it goes. Okay, it's got a white thing behind it, but um, you know it's okay. Um, if you want to go to this URL or scan that QR code on your laptop or your internet-enabled smartphone device, um, the idea is to just jam on that big button whenever I say channels. Um, and uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is an average of what the entire audience thinks. Um, and what you're seeing on your, your own device is, uh, is your, your, um, your personal guess, so you can kind of see how close you're hewing to the masses. Um, yeah, but uh, first we're going to get started talking about, oh, this has fallen off of me. Has that ever happened to anybody speaking before, you think? There we go. Um, first we're going to talk about what exactly the assignment was, right? So uh, as I mentioned, I worked at GridPoint, and uh, I'm not going to go into too much about what we do there. Come find us in the hallways roaming around. We'll be glad to talk to you more about it. Um, but we get to use the trifecta, which is awesome, right? Elixir and Phoenix and NERVs. Uh, more specifically, we have a core Phoenix application, which um, you know, runs our business logic and serves up LiveView. Uh, we have nervous based IoT devices that we just deploy out to customer sites. And this lets us run Elixir across our entire ecosystem, pretty much. That's why the asterisk is there. We're going to talk about that. Um, and almost all of our traffic, inbound and outbound, from the server out to whatever devices is over channels. This is before we've set up this web API, right? So um, just for the edification of those who might not be super, does anybody know what Phoenix Channels is? OK, we'll just skip this part. <laughs> um, but just so we have some, some shared terminology, uh, it's kind of set up like this, where you have a, a channel server, and you have multiple clients who are connecting to it. Um, you use topics to route them to various channels, which are represented as Elixir processes. And uh, the clients and the servers are free to send messages back and forth whenever they like. So it's not this sort of like rigid request response cycle. Um, so this, these are a lot of words. Um, channel, channel server, socket, transport, reply. I'm not going to read them all. 
but they are words that uh, you will almost certainly come across when you're talking just out loud to your team or to consumers of your API. Um, and some of these are kind of overloaded. Some of these are kind of like interchangeable at times. Like, do you, do you call it a route or a topic? Like, in, in plain conversation, sometimes you can kind of just kind of pick and choose, and most of the time people know what you're talking about. But sometimes it's really important, especially for people who are new to channels, especially like API consumers um, who aren't familiar with this terminology, to establish a shared vocabulary, right? Um, within your team, even if it doesn't agree with like the outside world 100%, uh, it's important to be able to talk with your other team members about you know what a channel is and what you mean when you say that, um, and you know try to try to say that. So that's the first pro tip. The pro tips are in big um, font, so that's how you know that they're tips. Um, so we know what the assignment is right now, right? Create a web API. Uh, we're supporting a native mobile app with it. I didn't mention that, um, but we have an iOS client that's being developed, or was being developed, is being developed. Is anything ever finished being developed? Um, and we have these Phoenix channels. So uh, wh why, like why, though? Um, uh, well, there were some really important considerations that went into this. One of them, as I mentioned, is uh, we're already using channels across our ecosystem to talk to devices, right? So like, why does a phone need to be any different than a temperature sensor? Or like, why does a reading from a thermometer need to be any different than you know, human input on a device? Um, so that was kind of the idea, right? We're already using this thing, and it works great. So why mix it up? Um, we already have skilled engineers who are uh, building this, and so we don't need to teach them anything new. There's no new frameworks or libraries introduced. Um, don't need to come up with any new testing strategies. So it kind of just comes right off the runway, pretty nice. And uh, real time is baked in, and this is really important for our app. Um, we usually have teams of people who are collaborating at a customer site installing things. Um, and we needed them all to know what's going on with everybody else so they can complete the installation successfully. So pro tip, it's big, it's a big font. Um, evaluate your current tool set. Um, you know, like, if you're already using Elixir, that's great. If you're already using Phoenix, that's great. If you're already using Channels, that's great. Like, kind of just climb up this ladder. Um, it might make a lot of sense to do this. If you're not doing any of those things, I'm not sure why you're here. Um, but uh, maybe something else would be a better fit. Everything has trade-offs. Um, so as a brief interlude, I want to design the app. Uh, just from a very conceptual perspective, just so we have a shared mental model of like something to talk about as we work through some examples. Uh, yeah, so I have a few big passions in life, and uh, programming is one, and music is another one. So we're going um, to design an app that lets you browse through some songs, uh, see info about a particular song, and then view the lyrics sort of stanza by stanza. Uh, I'm using stanza in like the poetic sense here, so if you've read the liner notes on albums and you're reading the lyrics, these are kind of like broken up into little blocks. Um, and then maybe there's a feature that lets you like a stanza or put a heart on it or whatever. So this is our example user flow we're going to be working through. Um, I did choose the song Tallahassee by the Mountain Goats because we're in Florida, and the Mountain Goats are the best. Uh, so, uh, can you get a round of applause for the mountain goats, actually? Thank you. Um, uh, so, we're going we're gonna to pretend there, a user is going through here, getting info about a song, trying to get the first stanza of the lyrics, and then, and then get the following stanza. Um, so, this, is, this, this first like, interaction that we're going to look at is, uh, is going to be modeled on something like REST, like a request-response or sort of classical API-type system. So, the client comes along, and says, hello, I'm client. I'm interested in Tallahassee. And the server says, nice to meet you. Here's some info about Tallahassee. And then the client says, hello, I'm client. I like the first stanza of Tallahassee. And the server says, nice to meet you. Here's stanza one. And the client comes back and says, hello, I'm client. I like the second stanza of Tallahassee. And the server says, nice to meet you. Here's stanza two. Um, notice that the client need to like, introduce themselves each time. And they needed to say which stanza it was. They need to kind of keep track of the fact that they had already looked at stanza one before they requested stanza two. So some probably uh, client-side state was involved. This is like three very discrete interactions, right, because of this. Um, and that's fine. This is, a, this is, this is not um, a knock on classical APIs, but this is just to understand sort of the, uh, the paradigm shift that we're talking about here, right? So 
we're going we're gonna to run through the conversation again, but this time, this is kind of how it looks in our API in channels today. So we kind of start off the same, client introduces themselves, the server replies. It's a very um, polite API. I don't think that's a requirement for Phoenix channels APIs, but sure, it sure would be nice, huh, if there was just more politeness in the world. Um, so the client next says, great, I'd like the first stanza, please. And notice that they don't have to specify like what song they're talking about, because now there's a conversation going on, right? They, the, the server already knows that they're talking about the song Tallahassee. So it can just give that back. And then the client says, I'd like the next stanza now. And the key piece of this one is the next stanza, not stanza two, right? The client already knows, our server already knows they're talking about the first stanza of Tallahassee, so the next stanza is stanza two. And the client doesn't need to keep track of all that stuff. They just have a conversation. So this is what I mean by a conversational web API. Um, and it's a really cool way to think about this problem. So this is a big pro tip. It, I mean, the size of the font is the same. It's not any bigger. But like the idea might be a little bit bigger, is to think conversationally about your API design if you're going to do this. Um, we didn't, at first, really kind of grok this. Um, and we were designing something that felt very much like a classical web API in Phoenix channels, because like, you can do that. Um, but you know, lean into what your new tool gives you. And, and think about things in a new way. And you might find something neat and unexpected, and everybody's happy. Um, yeah, some other advantages of this, you know, there's fewer HTTP requests, which means there's fewer TLS handshakes, which means there's less network overhead. Um, you have a persistent connection that you're just talking back and forth over. So let's talk about the implementation, or sort of what it looked like. I don't like these, like, goofy slide animations. But my wife was very insistent that the penguin needed to kind of like zoom in from the side. Um, so there, there you are. Um, just a, a reminder, like here's the, here's the kind of flow we're talking about. So here's some REST endpoints that we might see for something like this. Um, you know, get all the songs, or you get a particular song, or a stanza, or um, like a stanza. This isn't supposed to be like a well-designed REST API. It's just purely illustrative purposes. So I don't need any heckling. Um, so here's, what, here's the way to kind of think about it with channels, right? You're joining a song's topic. Now you're talking about all of the possible songs, and you can get information about them. Then when you know what song you're interested in, you're joining a particular song's topic. Then you're talking about a particular song. And any further messages that get sent down to the server are going to be in the context of that particular song you're talking about, right? Um, because like statelessness, and like HTTP and REST is, can be exactly what you need sometimes. Sometimes that's perfect. But as you kind of uh, work through problems with this channels philosophy, you, you realize that there's like, maybe like, just a little bit of state is okay. Like maybe a little bit of state would be nice, especially if you get it for free and you don't have to worry about it and you have the beam backing you up. Um, so yeah, so uh, once you're talking about a song, messages are just flowing back and forth. Like get a particular stanza, or like a stanza. And you can do stuff like this, right, where you get the next or the previous one, which, like, I don't know how you represent that as a REST endpoint without having some state on the server, right? Um, so a request comes in to your channel, and a client wants to join the song one topic. So you have to write a handler. And it looks something like this. We're going to walk through it. I know you're not supposed to do code on slides, but I'm breaking all the rules, baby. Um, so uh, we can just, you know, we have to write a join callback. We pattern match the ID out of the topic, and then we can use some context function to go look that up, and then uh, we shove it into the socket of science. That's where your little bit of state you get lives. Um, and then we reply back to the client with that information. Great. So then uh, a client requests, you know, a particular song, like index one. So again, just pattern match it out. No big deal. Um, we grab the stanza, maybe based on the song that's already in the socket of signs, right? Because we've already established that. That's like the context of the conversation. Um, and then we can assign that index to the socket. Uh, and now that's part of the context of the conversation, right? We send the stanza back. Which means that when a request comes in or a message comes in, I should say, see, I'm still using this outmoded terminology, this ancient language of requests and responses. Um, when a message comes in that they want the next stanza, you can you know, grab both the song and the index out of the assigns and increment the index again 
edge cases, right? Like, what if it's the last one? This isn't, this is illustrative code. So just like, chill out. Um, so yeah, then you just use that next, that incremented index to get the next song. Uh, and then you put that into the socket. So now that's the current stanza you're talking about, right? Or you get to the next stanza. Um, and you return that. So that's kind of how that goes. Um, oh, is this the same one I already did? Did I put it in here twice? Yeah, I think so. We'll just run, pretend like that was something else. Um, so you can also do cool stuff. Um, I mentioned briefly on the slide that I didn't talk about because everybody already knows about channels, um, that you can do asynchronous stuff really easily too. So this is like, imagine uh, we had a feature that lets you download a PDF about a song, right? And like we, we generate the PDF, and we, like, we put the album art on it and the, like, all the lyrics and we format it nice. Um, it takes a while to do that. So what we can do is when we get a request, or, see, I can't, I don't know, maybe I'm not good at this. Uh, when we get a message um, that uh, the, the client wants to download a PDF of the current song, um, we can just like farm that out to a worker, some other process that's gonna do that with a reference to the conversation that we're having, right? And then don't, just don't reply because the, the model that the client should be assuming is that they may or may not get replies and messages are gonna be coming across whenever. So they should have handlers on their end to deal with that, just like we have handlers on, on our end on the server. So uh, yeah, and then you, know, you might just send a regular old Elixir process with some download ready tuple and the result, and then later on, five minutes later, or 30 seconds, or however long your thing takes, um, that message will just kind of go through the channel, and hopefully the, the client will be ready. So embrace the paradigm shift. This is like the, big, the biggest one, again, not literally, but um, probably the most important one, because like I said, you can, des you can essentially design a typical, classical, you give me a request, I give you a response, I don't ever send you anything unannounced um, thing with Phoenix channels. There's no reason you can't. Um, and we almost did on accident. Um, but you know, you really sort of need to lean into this, I think, to reap the benefits. Otherwise, there's, there's no good reason to do it, I don't think. So we've got a, a basic implementation going, and now we wanna make it better. So don't try to read this, this is like a, a joke slide. It's just to show you that your, uh, your code can start to grow Pretty, uh, pretty quick. And you might have a module that has, or a, a channel module that has dozens of topics, right? And it starts to get out of control. So we were um, sort of naturally stumbled across this pattern where <clears throat> we have our channel module have callbacks that we pattern match the, the topic or the message on and just sort of hand those off to other modules to, to do the work of actually figuring out what needs to get sent back, if anything, or what needs to be performed. And what you end up with this is this like really easy to read sort of like top down uh, view into what a channel can handle, right? Like what messages it's expected to receive and where that work is being performed after that message comes in. So we had this going and everybody loved it and nobody was unhappy with anybody and I decided to just like try something dumb. So um, we're in Elixir, so like it's not that much of a leap to go from this to this with some macros um, and kind of start building out a little DSL that starts to look a, bit, a little bit like Phoenix Router. Um, because all you're doing is you know, grabbing these things and routing them off to some other module. Um, so I built this. Um, and you know, we can do stuff like this. And you can handle your regular process messages. And it looks so beautiful. Um, but we didn't do this. <laughs> um, there, was, there was some pushback uh, amongst my team, rightly so. It was, it was the right choice because we're, we're, you know, we're, we're getting really great terse code, but at the, uh, you know, with the trade-off of, you know, if somebody comes in here that's not worked with this, like, homespun DSL before, like, they're, they're not going to know what's going on. It's kind of harder to deal with. Maybe that just, like, you know, pattern matching regular functions and, and sending it along was a better way to do it. So that's what we're doing. But I do want to call out um, a really cool project by the folks at Felt called Channel Handler. And... Um, as, as we were starting to kind of come to some of these conclusions ourselves about how we should be setting this up and I'm writing my stupid macros, uh, I found a post where they were sort of coming to the same conclusions with this dispatch pattern, right? Um, so there's a library out right now that you can go to at that URL. Um, and uh, it's called Channel Handler. And it gives you this like really rich DSL for it that looks a lot like Phoenix Router, right? And it's got scopes, it's got plugs, and 
so you can do authorization on your requests. Um, because you got to remember, like, you're dealing with a persistent connection. So, like, at any time, a user's permissions might change. And if you don't, like, authenticate the messages that are coming in, you might be letting them do stuff they're not supposed to do. So this is really cool. And we are going to switch to this, I think. Um, it has some features that we need that, I'm sorry, it doesn't have some features that we need. I'm working on contributing those back upstream, go open source. Um, and then I think we're going to bring this in. So highly recommend checking this out. It's very cool. Reach for the dispatch pattern. I think whether you choose to just write plain Elixir functions or use some macros that may or may not be a good idea or reach for a library like this, um, I think this is a win no matter what. Because these channel modules really do end up looking and functioning a lot like your like, HTTP router does. So here's the final part, the explorer's guide. Uh, these are some, some like, kind of gotchas that we ran into um, and that I hope will be valuable to talk about. So the first one is um, showing a way that you might um, write a test that's asserting that when someone joins a particular channel, they're getting a particular reply. Um, pretty easy, right? The thing that this doesn't take into account is that we're not like sending Elixir terms down to clients. We're sending JSON. So it has to be serialized before it goes over the wire. And as you can see, we're not asserting on JSON because that would be madness. You have to deal with you know, escaping quotes and white space and stuff. So we don't want to do that. Um, but like, critically, we're not checking here that this can be serialized to JSON. Um, so we were running into problems where we had you know, tests that were great and passing, but the client wasn't getting the messages. We're like, why? So we went and looked at the logs, and you know, some of the things, for whatever reason, couldn't be serialized into JSON. So uh, by default, channels uses the default sort of like JSON serializer. Um, and there are some things it can and cannot encode. Um, you can swap that out, of course, if you need to. Um, and I'm sure somebody's going to be like, well, what about the like, at derive JSON encoder module attribute? Um, and that's potentially an answer. The reason it didn't work for us is because our like, core business schemas, they were already using that. They were being JSON encoded for some other purpose. And we were really you know, just focused on making this web API. And we, you know, we didn't want to step over, step all over what they were doing over there. So we needed a different solution. Um, just for like, illustration, right? Elixir map serializes to a JSON object, no problem. Um, does anybody know what this will serialize to? It's just a, you know, you know, it knows how to deal with atoms, it just turns them into strings, that's easy. Does anybody know what this will serialize to? Not ah, beans. You, you done crash your channel process. Um, it doesn't know how to handle tuples like by default. Um, so, so, you know, we were running into things like this that we couldn't catch because we were asserting on Elixir terms. Um, so what we did, um, actually this is a, just another example of that. Um, well, before I talk about our solution, let me talk about another, another kind of gotcha. Um, so we, we just saw how we might test a join, and this is how we might test um, a client pushing some message to our server once that conversation has already been established, right? And you can see, um, you know, we're asserting that the reply is, is okay and it's this map, and that's fine. Um, and we were also asserting, in a lot of cases, that um, it wasn't a map, it was a list, because that's what we wanted. We needed to send the client back a list of whatever. Um, and uh, the bad news about this is that, again, this works fine, but somewhere down in, you know, the, the depths of, of channels, um, there is a, a, a constraint that you must either send to be serialized a map, or there's like a, a binary uh, tuple that you can send, but almost always you're going to be wanting to send a map. Um, but again, at this phase in your test, it, it's not checking for that, right? So this would crash the channel because uh, it would try to you know, deal with this list and it's expecting either a map or this tuple and so it's gonna freak out, just like not know what to do. So uh, we added a, a little custom assertion. You probably have something like this in your project where you have a few of those hanging around um, called assert valid payload. 
Uh, because again, we didn't want in our, in our test, we didn't want to tr like, you know, encode that payload and then assert on that, because that's just bad news. Um, 28, huh? That's pretty impressive. Um, uh, so what assert valid payload does is it just, it just checks, like, hey, uh, the thing that you're about to assert on, can it be JSON encoded with your, you know, whatever serializer you're using? Uh, and if so, it just says okay and passes it on. Um, if it can't, then, you know, it raises an error, and we see that in our test. Um, so this was critical, and I think giving us confidence in the um, sorts of payloads we were sending back to, um, to our clients. Um, there's like a, a little demo I put together that's going to have like a version of these assertions and some of the other niceties we have. So um, you know, uh, you can check that out afterwards if you need some uh, example code. Um, here's another another problem case. Um, as we said, a map will serialize just fine into a JSON object. Does anybody know what a struct will serialize into? Yeah, no, nothing. Doesn't know how to deal with structs. Um, so uh, what we ended up doing here was um, creating sort of like API schemas based on our like core business schemas. And in those schemas, we can take in one of these, you know, the associated struct and maybe do some transformations to make sure it's JSON serializable and make sure that, you know, we, we have a, um, a function called build bang that, um, that we have a behavior for, it's callback, you have to implement in these API schemas. And it, you know, it, it takes in one of these core like business structs and spits out uh, a map that's JSON encodable and knows how to, you know, we're using embedded Ecto schemas and stuff for validation, which is really nice. Um, and it ended up being a big win. Uh, again, giving us confidence that like, no matter what we're trying to pipe down to the client, we're gonna catch it in our tests or, you know, uh, when, we're, when we're doing an implementation. Mind your messages. You can very easily write a well-tested channels uh, application that sends no messages to your clients and crashes constantly. Um, either that or you're like asserting on the JSON strings, don't do that. Um, another thing, uh, unless, you're, unless your API consumer is a JavaScript-based consumer, um, you can't really use the sort of like official Phoenix JS library, right? to interact with the socket. Um, the good news is other libraries do exist. Um, our particular implementation was uh, for an iOS app, and so we found a Swift Phoenix client. Um, good library, maintainer's great, very responsive, but it, it had some key things missing that we needed to make this uh, a viable solution. So, um, you know, our iOS developer had to, had to um, you know, get in there and get her hands dirty a bit. Um, that's not supposed to be the next slide. I don't know why that's there. Anyway, it was supposed to say, pretend it says this, like, prepare to get your hands dirty and send a big font. <laughs> um, that's what it was supposed to say. Um, anyways, um, so might Phoenix channels be a good fit for your API? I think if you establish a shared vocabulary, evaluate your surroundings, think conversationally and embrace the paradigm shift and reach for the dispatch pattern and mind your messages. And there's, that, there's the one I was talking about. <laughs> Prepare to get your hands dirty. Um, I think it's great and it's worked out really well for us. Um, and I think it's, it's a great fit for, for our team's needs. Um, one of the big takeaways I just kind of wanted to shove in the end is like, even if you're not gonna use channels for your next API project, this uh, sort of thinking about thinking outside of this like request response rest oriented style of API design um, was like really enlightening, I think for everybody on the team who's working on this. Um, so, you know, even if, even if it's not channels, like think about what else it might be. Um, I think that, you know, when we have something as ubiquitous as like HTTP rest APIs for communication over the web, we kind of like think that is the de facto solution and it doesn't have to be. And, you know, in our case we found one that was way better. That's all I've got slides, slides wise. Do you want to like, see a quick demo? I'm going to do it no matter what you say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me get this set up real quick. 46 is the number we ended up with. Does anybody have 46? Lucky 46. If you got 46, you win. I don't, I don't know. Come see me later and I'll give you something. <laughs> don't ruin it. God. <laughs> People are the worst. 
Uh, all right, let me, uh, let me just get this set up briefly. This will probably take longer or less time than it was taking for me to initially get the stupid counter working, so don't worry. Okay. I'm going to make this text bigger. Don't you worry. Okay, can everybody say that all right? Um, so, let me. All right, so uh, on the right, we have the iOS simulator running a native iOS app. Um, and it's the app we talked about throughout this entire presentation. Um, again, I'll have all the code for this available at some point. It's pretty hacky right now, so I'll clean it up before I, I give it to y'all. Um, but yeah, it'll be there eventually. Um, so uh, as you can see, we can like look at a song. This is just running against a local um, Phoenix server. Do I know how to use this programming environment, he asks. Surely he uses it all day, every day, and it's true, but you know, things are different when you're in front of a crowd. Um, yeah, so there's, here's the server, right? We, we see we get um, uh, a join here for the song with the ID of one, and if we navigate back where we can get a different song, and we, we get that and we serve it up. Um, and then, you know, so you can see here we're displaying some more information and uh, we can get the lyrics to come up. And you can see in our logs here that, you know, we get, you know, stanza get is incoming. You know, that's, and that's all we had to say, just like get, this, get this, this stanza. And then, like, when we tap over to the side, it gets the next one. And again, we're, we're, now we're having a conversation about this song. And so we're just saying, give me the next thing and, and give me the next thing. Or, like, you can tap on the left side and it'll give you the previous thing. And there's no no state on the client, right? It's all just in the socket connection. Um, it's cool. Um, let's see, what song is this? Three? Song ID three? And then uh, what, are, what, 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 uh, what will be in the second stanza? So if I hop back over here, and uh, I'm going to hook up a second client real quick. So this will be like another um, API client connected to your, to your server. Um, it's going to be a, a command line. API client, but you can imagine this was just another phone or another whatever. Um, so I will <laughs> demos. Why am I trying to cat this? This doesn't make any sense. There we go. Okay, so now we're connected uh, to the, the server and we're going to join uh, the channel for song three. I think it was, yeah. Um, and we can you know, get that first stanza. And you can see down here, you know, this is the this is the actual JSON that's coming down. So this is what your uh, your client side would be dealing with, um, pretty standard stuff. Um, and then I'll get the next one. I think that puts us on on stanza number two. What I can do now is I'm gonna pretend like this this client is going to like that stanza. So we do that, and we can see a like. Um, it was gonna be like hearts bubbling up or something, but time, you know, am I right? <laughs> Can't live with it. We can't live without it. Um, so, but but the the idea here is that really it was like one line of application code to just say, hey, for all the clients that are talking about this particular song, and then all the ones who are looking at this particular stanza, if one of them likes it, broadcast out to all the rest of them that that has happened. And then it was like one line of code in my client in the in the iOS application to say, hey, if a like comes in and you're on that stanza, then you know. Do, do something. In this case, it looks dumb, but that's what it is. Uh, that's it. That's all I have for real this time. 